All right, Paul, so we have a bunch of data and observations, and we're starting to build this model. And we're using the constraints, these measurements that we have, to inform this model. So where do we go to here? The next constraint, I mean, so far our constraints are only on the whole sun. Yep. Somewhere in the sun it must produce enough energy. That's right. Somewhere in the sun it must have enough mass. But now we can start looking at individual regions. Okay. Let's imagine we break the sun up into imaginary shells. Okay. Now for each shell, if the temperature intensity is in the middle is high enough, mm -hmm. it's going to be generating some power. That's right. But most of the outer regions are not going to generate any power. Okay. And there's also going to be heat coming in from below and heat going out from above. Okay. Right. So, yeah, I guess the, the heat is coming out, escaping. That's right. And right in the middle, you also have some heat generated. Yep. And because of the law of conservation of energy, if you take the heat in and add the heat generated, it must equal the heat out. That's right. Because energy's not appearing or disappearing. Exactly. That's right. So for every layer of the sun, you can work out how much heat is going in, how much is going out, how much is generated, and they must balance. Okay. And so we can kind of put these layers together to figure out what is happening where. And to do this, we have to understand how heat moves from one place to another. Yep. Okay. On Earth, we talk about conduction, convection, and radiation as ways that heat move. Yep. In the sun, there are basically two ways. One is by radiation. Okay. So let's imagine you've got some particle of light carrying energy. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get far on the sun. The sun is pretty dense. So it's not going to move from the inside all the way to the outside? Yes. The sun is ionized, which means it's, uh, hydrogen has lost its electrons, and that makes it very opaque. It's actually the same reason why metal is opaque, because in metal, the electrons are free. Whenever anything has got ionized, it, becomes, it blocks light very well. Yep. So it turns out that while the photons are traveling at the speed of light, that would only take them like a, a few seconds to get out of the middle of the sun if they could go straight there, but they can't. They must bing, 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 bing. So they have a very long path. This is called a random walk for obvious reasons, like some drunk staggering home from the <laughs> pub. But nonetheless, there will on average be, you know, some photons are going to be random walking down, some are going to be random walking up. But if it's hotter at the bottom, there'll be slightly more working their way up than are working their way down. Okay, so what you're saying is that because there has to be some coming up from the top, that there is going to be more energy down here. Otherwise, we wouldn't get it. Yeah, so the laws of thermodynamics tell you that heat always goes from hot to cold. So this is radiation. The other thing that happens is convection. Okay. Now, do you know what convection is? Well, I mean, we use this all the time, but do, I don't know if we're actually talking about, are we talking about convection, say, from a, a wood fire heat? Yeah, I mean, when you've got a hot fire, you're getting radiation heat That's coming right. okay. from it. But also what happens is it'll heat up the air near it. That's right. And when you heat up air, it rises. So, so what you're saying then is we have a heat source, starts to generate energy, and it's also now transferring the energy and warming up a new shell as we're looking at in the sun. That's right. So what I've got here is I've simulated some slab of gas yep. and I'm pumping heat in at the bottom. Okay, so the heat sources are red. So that's our yes. energy source. This would be like what happens on a hot day on Earth. The sun yep. hits the Earth's surface and starts heating up to get very hot air like a heat haze near the surface. That's right. Or if you heat up a kettle of water, you've got flames at the bottom. Yep. And what happens is it gets less dense and starts to rise. Okay. And to begin with, it can't get itself organized, but eventually you'll start getting columns of hot air that will start rising. And so, so now all of a sudden, instead of having these really just thin layer, we have these columns of not as hot air, but still hotter than the air around it. Yeah. So the hot air starts pulling upwards and that starts sucking more cold air in underneath to replace it. And so now as we get more cold air, that cold air is also being heated as it comes up. That's right, and this is what convection is. So basically it's when you've got a heat source at the bottom and the fluid can, is free to move and it will start carrying the heat upwards. And this is responsible for like thunderstorms on Earth. If you're boiling a kettle, you can see the water. You That's right. throw the frozen peas and you'll see them moving around like crazy, carried by the convection currents. Um, often it's how heating will work in a room. Yep. If you have a heater at one side of a room, hot air will rise there, flow out across the room and cold air will be sucked in underneath to come back to it. So convection is a very good energy source. And I guess, you know, now that we've seen this for a while, instead of this whole area being this really cold blue temperature, now pretty much everywhere in this gas is a little bit warmer, and now the majority of it is substantially warm. So it's a very effective way of getting heat from one place to another. Okay. So we're going to have some combination of these two. Now you can calculate whether it's going to be radiation or convection. Basically, it depends on how rapidly the temperature drops off with height. Oh, okay. If it drops off really rapidly, you get convection. If it drops off only gently with height, you won't get convection because the hot air will rise and then stop immediately. So you have to figure out how fast that rate is and then what combination of convection and radiation you're getting. But that's a calculation we can do. Okay. So we, we'll know that 
if we have a particular temperature gradient, a yep. certain rate at which temperature increases, and a certain density and everything else, we can calculate how much the heat will flow. Okay. So this is our next constraint, uh, which is going to give us some sort of graph of temperature versus radius. So we don't know the exact structure, but we know it does do some things as it comes down from the center to the outside. And at each point, it must be sloping enough, yep. depending on whether it's radiation or convection at that time, to push enough heat out to give us the luminosity. And that must apply every single layer. So it always has to be going down. It's just how up or how strong that slope is. If, for example, you had a very steep gradient instead of a very flat gradient, they'll be yep. pushing lots of heat down here and a little bit over there, so heat would build up. Okay. So that middle region will get hotter and hotter, uh -huh. until it's no longer a sudden break. It becomes a smoother distribution. Okay. So we now have three constraints. Total mass must match observation. Total power must match observation. But also the temperature gradient must allow steady heat flow everywhere. Well, this is actually kind of important, right? I mean, not that these two are important. This is starting to tell us a lot of the structure on the inside, which we really can't see. Yeah, this is so we can't just put our heat flow anywhere. Yep. It has to be distributed across the sun in just the right way to allow the heat to actually flow out.